Good morning. The subcommittee will come to order. This is the Constitution, Civil Rights, and Civil Liberties Committee, chaired by uh, Jerry Nadler and the uh, ranking members, Jim Sensenbrenner. I, I want to welcome our witnesses to what I consider an unusual and important uh, hearing in this subcommittee. And I begin by welcoming this distinguished list of witnesses. Former Associate Deputy Attorney General Bruce Fine is with us this morning. Ms. Mary Ellen O'Connell uh, from University of Notre Dame Law School is on a plane uh, that's delayed and she'll be here shortly. Mr. Jeremy Scahill, investigative reporter uh, Mr. Michael W. Lewis, Associate professor, professor of Law at Ohio Northern University, Pettit College of Law. Uh, Jamil Jaffer of the Kellogg Huber Hansen Law Firm, the direct, Director of the American Civil Liberties Union, Washington office, Laura Murphy, and the Honorable Thomas R. Pickering, the former Under Secretary of State and former United States Ambassador uh, to the United Nations. Uh, without objection, of course, uh, all of the uh, witnesses' statements will appear in the record. and. Uh, before I uh, ask you to begin, Ambassador Pickering, uh, I and uh, Mr. Sensenbrenner wanted to make a couple comments with reference to the issue that brings us here today. Uh, the subject is a hearing on national security and civil liberties. Obviously, the uh, the first question is, uh, uh, is there a tension between the two uh, or are there areas of compatibility? Uh, the power of what uh, has begun to be termed the imperial presidency uh, grows and the ability of our democratic institutions, especially the federal legislative branch, us uh, to constrain it seems more uncertain. And so to begin with, there seems to be uh, an agreement that in the 43rd presidency, there was left behind a grossly expanded national security state and a tragic le legacy of civil rights abuses uh, to it. Uh, the creation of off-the-books black sites, the use of waterboarding and other tortures in apparent violation of United States and in international law, the cover-up of these crimes by the admitted destruction of videotapes of some of these uh, brutal interrogations, a destruction that appears to have been not only intention, intentional, but in violation of court orders. The construction of a vast domestic surveillance apparatus and widespread warrantless wiretapping. Uh, the mass detentions at Guantanamo Bay Prison, a scheme so ill-conceived that the Supreme Court and lower federal courts have overruled the previous administration's judgment more than one dozen times. Extraordinary rendition of suspects to foreign governments for abusive inter interrogation. Uh, the Guantanamo situation is further complicated by the fact that last night in, it was the found out in the continuing resolution 
that there was a provision inserted by still no one knows whom uh, that allowed, uh, that prevented anyone on Guantanamo, uh, the prosecutors would no longer determine whether uh, they would prosecute under a Title III uh, federal court or whether there would be a military commission. And there was language in there that said that it would be only military commissions. It never went to Judiciary Committee and uh, it nearly resulted in the whole bill uh, collapsing because myself and at least three or four other members uh, were prepared to vote against the whole resolution. We did not, and, and the bill barely passed. Uh, the extraordinary rendition of suspects to foreign governments uh, for what is more likely to be expected abusive interrogation. The ignoring of congressional enactments such as the McCain Amendment preventing abuse of detainees through illegitimate signing statements. Uh, the repeated invocation of the state secrets privilege, which has gone on in recent years, including this administration, to a, 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 an incredible new height, to shut down complaints, investigations, and lawsuits challenging executive branch action, such as illegal domestic s surveillance, torture, and rendition. Uh, the making of, uh, mem of numerous unsubstantiated claims of executive privilege uh, to create legal immunity from congressional subpoena uh, to avoid legislative oversight, uh, claims uh, uh, often when challenged in federal court by the House Judiciary Committee, the House Judiciary Committee prevailed. And then uh, on top of all of these uh, sits the United USA Patriot Act, uh, passed by a compliant and overreactive Congress in the weeks following 9-11. Multiple uh, Department of Justice reviews have found abuse of the Patriot Act provisions on national security letters, which allows records to be seized on the thinnest legal showing of mere relevance and require abusive gag orders. Other provisions of the Patriot Act, such as the so-called library provision and the sneak and peek searches equally threaten and in my view, our, our liberty. Now the 44th president started his term on a positive note when he is, said he would ban torture, the use of secret prisons or black site, ordered the Guantanamo detention camp closed, uh, revoked uh, uh, a, a gravely flawed uh, office of legal counsel memos on torture and other related subjects, but the administration has failed to adequately investigate, much less prosecute, apparent na national security crimes, including torture and waterboarding, and does not appear to have even investigated uh, who approved or ordered uh, these uh, activities in the first place. Uh, this would include investigation of the 43rd president who has written a book uh, personally admitting and giving details of, of uh, how and why he did what he did. Uh, the present administration has refused to prosecute the intentional destruction of the evidence of the crimes of what he did. That's known for anybody that's been around a few years uh, the cover-up, which is usually more prosecutable than the crime itself. Uh, evidence of these crimes, CIO videotapes of the interrogations themselves. Uh, 
The formerly secret State Department cables recently released show that in addition to refusing to carry out its own investigation of torture, the administration, this administration, worked to squelch other countries investigating the same subject matter. And I have citations that will be uh, brought in on all of these. Uh, the ad administration continues to rely on clearly overbroad interpretations of the state secrets privilege to shut down lawsuits challenging executive branch uh, activity that can be termed as misconduct, inappropriate or illegal. Public reports describe the extensive use uh, of uh, drones, uh, not only in the battlefield where uh, villages and huge civilian populations can be destroyed, uh, 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 which amounts uh, in, in to a, an incredible uh, extension of uh, war in a new sense uh, unlike any that we've experienced before. Uh, there may not, uh, I, I know everyone's read about the claim that this administration and previous ones have claimed the po power uh, to target and assassinate uh, anyone com uh, determined to be an enemy, including Americans. Uh, the president uh, has uh, implied that the, the, this president has implied that the administration may resort to detaining individuals indefinitely without trial. Uh, fortunately, it, ha it hasn't gone beyond the, the, the uh, thinking out loud about it. But to me, uh, and to other members on this committee, it's fundamentally at odds with the Constitution and the traditions of freedom and due process of law. And despite the effort of the President's task force, Guantanamo Bay detention camp remains open with 170 people still in limbo, detainees or prisoners still in limbo. And while we in Congress, uh, and I'm not trying to uh, exclude us from receiving some of the criticism that I'm directing to the other branch of government, uh, it's an important uh, and critical uh, subject matter that bring us here today. I'm very proud of the fact that the former chairman of Judiciary Committee, Jim Sensenbrenner, is with us as the ranking member, and I would recognize him at this time. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And uh, it, listening to the opening statement of my esteemed friend, the gentleman from Michigan, I think he's turned the calendar back two years because uh, this sounds like the speech that he gave indicting the Bush administration two years ago, and uh, there just hasn't been any hope and change uh, uh, around here. Now, That's right. Okay. Well, you were supposed to bring about the hope and change, and you know we're still waiting for it. Uh, what I can say is that this committee um, uh, approved a reauthorization of the Patriot Act without any change. That's a Patriot Act that I wrote following 9/11, and you know the national security letters issue was not one of the expanded law enforcement functions in the Patriot Act. Uh, but was a law that was originally enacted in 1986, sponsored by Senator <coughs> Leahy and Representative Kastenmeier. Now, you know, just yesterday, in the continuing resolution, which my good friend Mr. Conyers and our subcommittee chair, Mr. Nadler, voted for, contained a provision that prevents the administration from closing Guantanamo and relocating the detainees in the United States um, and uh, prohibits the transfer of any detainee 
who is not a U.S. citizen and who is held in the Guantanamo Detention Center uh, on or after June 24, 2009. And that's despite the efforts of the administration and the executive order the President signed uh, early in his tenure in office. So, you know, I don't see why we need to have this hearing today because it's talking about things in the past. Uh, it's talking about things that my friend Mr. Conyers and Mr. Nadler voted to continue when they voted for the continuing resolution uh, yesterday. So if he wishes to continue with this hearing, I think that's fine. He's the chairman. Uh, Bob, I can want to wish him and everybody in the room a very blessed Christmas season and a productive new year because next year when this committee is under new management, uh, we will be much more productive, much more relevant, and we won't be looking at the calendar of last year or two years ago. Thank you. Uh, well, I thank you at least for coming to the, the meeting uh, to make a statement, uh, uh, Mr. Sensenbrenner. Uh, of course, a hearing can only be uh, held on things that happened in the past. Uh, I've never heard of a hearing, well, around here I have heard of hearings uh, of things that are going to happen in the future, but more than normal, normally they're in the past. Uh, Ambassador Thomas Pickering is vice chairman of Hills and Company, an international consulting firm, and serves as a member of the Constitution Project's Liberty and Security Committee. He's had a distinguished career spanning over five decades as a United States diplomat, serving as Under Secretary of State for Political Affairs, Ambassador to the United Nations, Ambassador to Russia, Ambassador to India, Israel, Nigeria, Jordan, and El Salvador. I must say, Ambassador, I read your, uh, your submitted statement, which is now being printed in the record, and was amazed at the uh, depth and breadth and conviction that keeps you uh, coming before us and working in government in your own way. We thank you and appreciate you being here and invite you to make your statement at this time. Chairman and members, and thank you for your kind words. I'm pleased to come before you as a diplomat with extensive service in the country with a single simple message. I don't believe that our national security and protection of our civil liberties are mutually exclusive. In fact, I believe they are intimately tied together. The key task is to work together to find ways to assure both priorities are met in the interests of our people and of their government. What we do as a nation in this area determines whether we have the support and backing of our friends around the world and the respect of all who look to us for leadership. Failure to follow, follow our principles regarding civil liberty loses that respect. Even more, it sets an example for others that either we don't care or we have made expediency and compromises with our principles and overriding necessity. Once we do that, others will of course follow. The limits on their actions will not be set by us or others, but by what they believe they can and need to do to meet their immediate needs with little or no respect for human rights. We will then be in a position where our own citizens from whatever walk of life will be fitted into their construct and held for indefinite period and be subject to trials which do not assure the high standards to which we aspire and left with little for our diplomats to use to assist our personnel, our people, our citizens under these conditions. All of this reflects on our role as a state which aspires to lead in the field of human rights, which is looked to by many to do so, and where we play a role that deeply impacts on our interests, including our security at home. The trial of terrorism suspects is obviously of deep concern. The recent Ghailani terrorism prosecution in New York, despite the disappointment of many that the convictions were not more sweeping, 
is an example of the united states pursuing the right procedures in the correct court in trying terrorism suspects the run on a trial is only one out of over four hundred terrorism related trials that demonstrate that we can use article three courts i've already explained why i believe the use of our traditional criminal justice system has helped us to preserve and protect our foreign policy interests the american justice system is the established standard maybe even the gold standard around the world an effort on the part of the united states to strengthen and preserve the use of alternative methods specifically for terror related crimes has appeared to the rest of the world to detract from rather than strengthen our system of justice and by alternative methods i'm obviously here referring to military commissions within our own judicial arrangements during the last review uh, by the united states supreme court of military commissions it appeared that they failed to meet constitutional standards recently there have been increased calls for the use of indefinite or preventive detention instead of trying suspected terrorist detainees at all i believe that indefinite detention of individuals without charge under any guise short of prisoners of war in traditional state to state military conflicts either declared or undeclared raises all of the problems of abuse of state power to the detriment of individual rights in my view a system of indefinite detention without charge contravenes central principles of our own constitution and national standard of a right to notice of charges and to trial the detention issue presents a central conundrum of what to do when we believe all of the information at our disposal indicates that the detainee is guilty but we cannot put him or her through a federal trial for one or more reasons one such reason is that the information to be used at trial has been tainted by illegal and unacceptable methods of interrogation one example is information found to be inadmissible such as that in the Hailani trial we have a treaty obligation not to engage in torture or cruel inhuman or degrading treatment these practices also contravene domestic legislation although we all now agree that torture must be prohibited the value of information obtained through so called enhanced interrogation techniques is widely debated in the intelligence world the preponderance of evidence in my view is against the utility of such practices based on a reading of the materials which discuss it extensively in addition to the moral and legal issues many studies have found that evidence obtained through coercion coercion is inherently unreliable that raise raises the question about what to do with defendants in this category the options are stark and challenging they can be tried on the admissible evidence as Ghailani was they can be sent to jurisdictions which may have more evidence or different charges against which to try them outside our country they can be in the end released that in my view of course is a serious and difficult option but it is not an option that obviously we can ignore the danger here is that they will attempt once again to launch attacks on our country and its people the danger has to be balanced against the fact that the high level leadership of al qaeda bin laden and zawahiri and others also remain at large these are not easy choices mr chairman but the shorter term tactical considerations need also to be balanced against the longer term human rights and strategic issues for our country the second reason with respect to trial is that information was derived through intelligence collection where the tradition and the national interest are to protect the sources and methods of collection the government has developed a practice of clearing and briefing judges and attorneys for the use of this protected evidence in courts under the classified information procedures act of 1980 there are in that legislation ways to protect sources and methods while making the principal elements of the evidence clear to those who need to know including the defendant this seems to be a respectable and responsible way to proceed safeguarding privacy and avoiding unnecessary secrecy as you yourself have just told us it is self evident that the rule of law requires appropriate safeguards to protect individuals right to privacy states traditionally for fiscal and security purposes at their borders have exercised the right to examine persons and goods entering their territory on an absolute basis 
with exceptions only for diplomatic and state immunity it is obvious that this needs to be done for the purpose of protecting the country and carrying out its laws on trade and commerce but such searches must also be conducted in a manner that minimizes intrusion into individual privacy in addition we use the process of issuing visas to prevent to permit people to present themselves at our borders for admission into the country we do so in a way that among other things reduces security risk we should however avoid a blanket selection of everyone from one or a number of countries for special treatment and review wherever possible uh, including in their their background instead we should rely on actual intelligence and the application of standards of reasonable suspicion to determine which individuals actually pose threats ethnic racial national or other profiling have brought growing antagonism to the united states on the part of many many innocent people who have been affected by these practices this in turn has fostered resentment against the country which terrorists and others have used to recruit individuals to act against the united states mr chairman the sum total of this is that we must comport ourselves in the prosecution and indeed the the detention and the other aspects of our concern uh, rightful concern about terrorism in ways that continue to enhance our capacity to lead in the world particularly in the areas of human rights and civil rights uh, we must treat individuals in accordance with our constitution uh, as we would expect to have our citizens treated around the world uh, and we should do so in ways uh, that balance the security needs that we have with the rights to uh, civil and indeed human rights in this country that's the essence of my discussion here this morning and I thank you for the opportunity ambassador Pickering I uh, want to congratulate you uh, and hope that you continue to speak and read and write on the subject of your experience uh, for a long time to come. Uh, thank you very much you, for, for opening uh, this discussion up. I turn now to the director of the American Civil Liberties Union, Laura Murphy. Her, her family is, is very well known. Uh, her father uh, created, was it the Pittsburgh Courier? The Afro, my great grandfather created the Afro-American newspapers. What, what were they? What were they called? Uh, the Afro-American newspapers. Uh, but they, and they were nationwide. They were in five cities: Richmond, Philadelphia, Newark, Baltimore, Washington D.C., Richmond. Well, I used to deliver something that had Murphy on it in <laughs> it Detroit. It was the Afro. <laughs> yes, uh, and. Uh, uh, her brother is a distinguished civil rights lawyer now in New York. She herself is, uh, has 30 years of policy making and political expertise at both the national, state, and local levels. In previous professional positions, Ms. Murphy has served as chief of staff to the California Assembly Speaker, a cabinet member, for the mayor of the District of Columbia, an account executive for a public affairs organization, and a legislative assistant for two members of the House of Representatives. Uh, she, she represents the Washington branch of, a, of an organization that is very distinguished and uh, is well known uh, to the House Judiciary Committee because they come before us so regularly. Uh, the, w the one comment I have about her paper, because it was in, in small print and had to be enlarged for my reading, is that it is, the, it is the longest and one of the best papers. Normally when we get large quantities of uh, speech preparation, we say, oh, oh. But this was not the case in, in your case. I want to commend you for the thorough 
review of, of the subject matter before us and the work of uh, ACLU in, in this regard. And we welcome you this morning before our committee. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and it's been my honor since I first became a lobbyist for the ACLU in 1979 to have known you and worked with you over all of these years, and we so appreciate your stewardship of this committee. Um, thank you for being here today. I appreciate the opportunity to testify on behalf of the ACLU on this important subject. There is no question that the 9-11 attacks were a serious blow to our nation and the risk of significant future attacks is a frightening prospect and something our government must work to prevent. But we must work intelligently to, pre to prevent attacks, and we must do so with the integrity that we as Americans owe to our constitutional heritage ourselves and to future generations. In particular, history teaches us that the executive branch of the U.S. government, regardless, regardless of the party in power, always seizes opportunities to expand its own power, and the American people need Congress to serve as a healthy check on that tendency. We need to make sure that the steps we take to protect ourselves are smart ones, and we need to keep faith with our nation's highest ideals as outlined in the Bill of Rights, which are the source of the real strength of our nation. In recent years, in the wake of 9-11, unfortunately, we have not done this. The examples are many. And as you say, uh, my staff has prepared excellent testimony illustrating many of these examples. Illegal warrantless wiretapping, the targeted killings of Americans without trial far from any battlefield, unjustifiably intrusive airline security measures, military commissions, state secrets, indefinite detention, out of control watch lists, the Patriot Act. Never before has the executive branch had such sweeping powers. This is a radical departure for our country. Despite this, some are clamoring to give even more broad powers to the executive branch. Let me briefly mention three that the Congress is likely to confront. Authorization for the use of military force. One absolutely crucial issue is indefinite detention and the authorization for use of military force. Twice introduced by the incoming full committee chairman Lamar Smith and Senator Lindsey Graham, their legislation would declare that the U.S. is in a worldwide war without end. It's just two simple sentences in their proposal, but it would drastically expand the power of the executive even further and forever alter the course of U.S. history. We wonder how many members of Congress realize the monumental effect that the proposed new declaration of war would have. It has no time limits or geographic boundaries. It authorizes indefinite imprisonment without charge or trial, including against Americans in America. Is this the heritage our generation wants to pass along to future Americans? The, a second issue that Congress will be confronting is the Obama administration's reported plans to change the very architecture of the Internet to make eavesdropping easier. As reported, this radical proposal would require all online services, even those which operate by putting individuals in direct contact with each other using encryption to restructure the way their services work in order to make it easier for the government to eavesdrop upon demand. This step would interfere with technological innovation, create si significant new cybersecurity vulnerabilities, re reduce privacy, and chill expression on the Internet and pose great dangers of abuse. The third upcoming issue I wanted to mention, which will be before this committee very shortly, is the reauthorization of, of the Patriot Act. There are a couple of sections up for reauthorization before February 28th, including Section 215, the so-called library provisions, which gives the government sweeping new powers to seize records or goods from anyone, even people who aren't suspected of doing anything wrong who are somehow just relevant to an investigation. Roving John Doe wiretaps. The Fourth Amendment requires warrants to state with particularity the things to be searched or seized, but this sweeping authority permits the government to get in order without naming either the place or the person to be taxed. Either one or the other should be required. Protecting the Constitution is not a partisan issue. 
the executive branch, whether under control of Democrats or Republicans, tends to push for expanded powers of monitoring and control over the American people. It is up to the legislative branch to push back. And in closing, Mr. Conyers, I'm sorry that Mr. Sensenbrenner wasn't able to stay longer, but I would ask that the committee allow to be put in the record a report recently issued by the ACLU called The New Normal, talking about how many of the um, expanded executive branch powers have been carried over by the Obama administration. Uh, without objection, we'll, we'll do that. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. I'm now pleased to welcome Jamil Jaffer, Esquire of the Kellogg firm. He has previously served as associate counsel to the president from 2008 to 2009 as a counsel to assistant attorney general at the Department of Justice, the National Security Division, and as counsel to the department's office of legal policy from 2005 to 2006. We have your statement, Attorney Jaffer, and we welcome you to the hearing this morning. You may proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <coughs> I'd like to thank the chairman and the ranking member for inviting me here to testify today. I'd like to spend uh, my opening statement discussing uh, the difficult questions that arise with respect to what to do about the detainees in Guantanamo Bay, the remaining 170 detainees. There are basically four options. We can try these detainees in federal courts. We can try them in military commissions. We could create a new national security court and try them there. Or we could detain them with no trial, no process other than the evaluation of their status, and retain the, detain them until the duration of the conflict is over. Now, the current approach of this administration and the prior administration, which has largely not changed, is a combination of the first two approaches. Try them in federal court or try them in military commissions. There's a fundamental problem with this approach, though. First, I would note that under the law, these individuals detained at Guantanamo Bay have no constitutional rights except what the Supreme Court has given them. And those constitutional rights are fairly limited. They're limited to a review in federal court of their status as enemy combatants. These are folks captured on the battlefield, captured abroad, and held abroad in Cuba. Now, they have no right to trial in federal court. They have no other rights to come with the right to a trial in federal court the right to a jury, the right to the exclusionary rule, and other similar rights. The criminal justice system that we have in this country is designed to exonerate the innocent and convict the guilty. And in doing so, we build in a strong presumption in favor of innocence. In essence, we stack the decks against conviction. And this makes a lot of sense. This is as it should be in the criminal context, because it's based on our view, long held in this country, that it is better if many of the guilty get off in order to save one instant for being convicted. But we confront then a fundamental policy question, not a legal question, but a policy question, whether this same approach should be applied to enemy combatants captured abroad on the battlefield of war. And if we do so, we must consider the, re the very real consequences. That is, if we fail to convict these, det these detainees in federal court, the typical analysis would suggest release. But in an era when we're engaged in a global war on terrorism, and we have recently learned that the individuals released from Gitmo, the ones who have been cleared for release and have been sent abroad, return to the fight at a rate of 25%, one must wonder whether it makes a lot of sense to take the remaining 170 detainees, try them in federal court, and then run the risk that we'll be presented with the Hobson's choice of releasing them because they haven't been convicted, or continue to detain them after they've been held not guilty by, by a jury. If we have take the latter approach, which the current attorney general has said may very well happen and could very well happen with Khalid Sheikh Mohammed if he's tried in a federal court, then you wonder, what is this project of trying folks in federal court really about? If it's about showing justice being done and justice being done in the American way, well then how can, how can we possibly justify continuing to detain these folks after they have been really, uh, found not guilty by a federal jury? And yet, we can't help but do that. These are the highest value detainees. Uh, this administration has gone through a review process determining that these 170, other than the ones who've been scheduled for release and simply can't be released because of the, the challenges in the countries which we'd release them to, are, 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 are it's a serious problem. Now, in addition to these issues with respect to the release of individuals who aren't convicted, 
it's simply, tr it's simply the case that many of the evidentiary rules in the federal courts don't make a lot of sense when the evidence and the witness come from abroad and on the battlefield. Moreover, there are security issues. For the people who live near the courthouse, think New York City, the judges and the court staff, and the civilian jurors who would be sitting in on these trials. Moreover, there are issues of classified information. And having worked with the talented prosecutors in the Department of Justice's National Security Division, I can tell you that while the Classified Information Procedures Act is extremely helpful, it is certainly not a panacea. I'd like to close briefly by returning to the basic options available to the government for moving forward. Again, we can try, the, try these detainees in the federal courts. We can try the military commissions. We can create a new national security court with different rules and different approaches, and perhaps then have justice seen to be done, or we can continue to detain them, no trial and no process save for status review. In my view, it's critical, as this committee is considering, that we balance national security and civil liberties, and that we be seen to do justice. The federal court project, as we've just discussed, is fraught with a number of difficulties. The military commissions, while better, also face significant public perception issues because of the nature of the middle military criminal justice system and the fact of having the, the very individuals who capture these folks try them then in court. And many have argued that the creation of a national security court staffed by sitting federal judges, nominated by the president, confirmed by the Senate, and prosecutions brought by the talented, outstanding prosecutors in the Department of Justice, and rules that make more sense than the current criminal federal court system for the trial of national security detainees is a reasonable approach. My view expressed in other settings is that the latter approach has many of the benefits of trials in federal court without the downsides, and it also lacks many of the downsides that come from the public perception associated with military commissions. Now, this is not an easy project. The creation of a new court would be a substantial challenge. It would take a lot of work, um, but it's something to consider. And with that, I uh, appreciate the, uh, the committee's time and uh, be happy to answer any questions the committee might have. Thank you very much, Attorney Jaffer. I, I now turn to Michael Lewis, welcome, an associate professor of law at Ohio Northern University. Uh, before that, he was a naval aviator in the United States Navy, and he is a cum laude Harvard Law School graduate, which we do not hold against anybody in, in the Judiciary Committee. But we do welcome you, we have your statement, and we'd like to hear from you at this time, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, also thank you to Ranking Member Sensenbrenner for inviting me to testify here today. Uh, in reading the other submissions, I noted that there was also an extensive discussion of the scope of the laws of armed conflict and the boundaries of the battlefield, and I actually filed a supplemental submission that I would on that issue that I would like to be appended to the record. We will be happy to take it into the record. Uh, as my written testimony focuses on the choice between Article Three courts and military commissions for trying uh, terrorists and al-Qaeda members. Uh, there, there's no question that Article Three courts are capable of trying terrorists and al-Qaeda members. We've seen that with Richard Reed, the shoe bomber, Zacharias Moussaoui, uh, as well as Timothy McVeigh. Uh, however, I believe that there is a subset of terrorist or al-Qaeda defendants whose proper place is before military commissions rather than Article Three courts. Uh, and that subset would be the group of defendants who are apprehended overseas by members of the United States military. And the reason for that is that the federal rules of evidence that determine what uh, evidence gets before criminal juries in federal court is based upon the police apprehension assumption. Basically the idea that law enforcement individuals who are trained in the preservation and collection of evidence in chain of custody, in Mirandizing defendants and uh, interrogating them appropriately under Miranda, uh, in drafting very detailed police reports that will stand up to cross-examination by skilled defense counsel, and perhaps most importantly, to be available weeks, months, or even years after the event to return to testify about the specifics of the arrest, again, subject to the cross-examination of skilled defense counsel. Uh, these assumptions underlie the federal rules of evidence 
and none of these assumptions are valid for that subset of defendants who are apprehended overseas by members of the U.S. military. Because the members of the U.S. military, combat troops, are not trained, nor should they be trained, in the collection and preservation of evidence, or in the uh, Mirandizing of defendants, or in the writing of police reports, and they are very likely to not be available weeks, months, or years later to come back and testify about the specifics of the arrest, which gives uh, a great deal of hearsay problem to any evidence that was collected at the time. Uh, and as a result of this, I think there are two major concerns that I, that I have. Uh, the first is obviously there is a great deal of evidence that is likely to be excluded from any trial um, because of the fact that these people are not trained in the preservation of such evidence. And we saw some of that in the Galilani trial, and that was even where uh, you had law enforcement agents that had gone over to Kenya and Tanzania to do uh, much of the investigation. But the other problem, and this is one that is less discussed and I think uh, equally important, is that if you decide to tell the military that all al-Qaeda members, all terrorists, will be tried before Article III courts, you're going to make the military become better police officers. And that's not something we want to do. Uh, in my submissions, if you look at page four, five, and six, there are a couple of different forms uh, that I have copied for the uh, committee to look at. On page four, you have a standard, what's called capture tag, that was used in Afghanistan. Uh, and that is a very short uh, piece of information that's required by the Geneva Conventions anytime you capture someone. It can be filled out in a minute and a half by anyone, whether they understand the federal rules of evidence or not. Uh, pages five and six contain a form that has been used by the coalition forces in Iraq and looks far more like a traditional police report. Uh, it requires a great deal of detailed information be uh, secured by the combat forces that are doing the apprehension, and it also requires some understanding of chain of custody, uh, evidence collection, et cetera. And the reason why this is a problem I is because our combat soldiers only have a limited amount of time to maintain their skills. And as someone who, at least for a brief period of time, uh, myself uh, achieved a, a high degree of combat proficiency, I can tell you that that combat proficiency is very perishable. And to the extent you take away training time from combat proficiency in order to learn how to properly withstand cross-examinations, fill out police reports, uh, and keep evidence, uh, you are likely to degrade the combat effectiveness of the troops that are being asked to do that. Uh, and so I would ask that we do not make that requirement of our uh, men and women overseas that are in combat. Thank you for the time. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Professor Lewis. Uh, we turn now to a Puffin Foundation writing fellow at the Nation Institute and Nonprofit Media Center, uh, Mr. Jeremy Scahill. Uh, he is an investigative journa journalist, an author, and a correspondent on both radio and television programs. We welcome you here this morning. Your statement will be included in the record. Welcome. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'm the national security correspondent for The Nation magazine. Uh, I'm proud of our editor, Katrina Vanden Heuvel. Um, I'd like to thank the chairman and this committee. I wish uh, that Ranking Member Sensenbrenner was here. Um, I'm from uh, his state of Wisconsin. I would have liked to engage with him on some of these issues. As we sit here today in Washington across the world, the United States is engaged in multiple wars. Some, like those in Afghanistan and Iraq, are well known. But there's another war, a covert shadow war, being waged in darkness by U.S. Special Operations Forces and the CIA across the globe. This war is largely void of any effective or meaningful congressional oversight and takes place in countries like Yemen, Somalia, and Pakistan, nations with which the U.S. is not officially at war. The actions and consequences of this shadow war are seldom discussed in public or investigated by the Congress, and yet they have a direct impact on the debates and legislation on national security and civil liberties here at home. Far from discussing the distant past, as Mr. Sensenbrenner indicated, I intend to talk about current U.S. policy and how the Obama administration has continued some of the most outrageous policies and dangerous policies of the Bush administration. The current U.S. strategy in this shadow war can be summed up as follows. We're trying to kill our way to peace, and the killing fields are growing in number. 
Congress has a responsibility to soberly and seriously address crucial questions. What impact are these clandestine operations having on U.S. national security? Are they making us more safe or less safe? When U.S. forces kill innocent civilians in so-called counterterrorism operations, are we inspiring a new generation of insurgents to rise against our country? And what is the oversight role of the U.S. Congress in the shadow wars that have spanned the Bush and Obama administrations? The most visible among these shadow wars, Mr. Chairman, is in Pakistan, where the U.S. regularly bombs that country using weaponized drones. At the same time, U.S. Special Operations Forces are engaged in covert offensive actions in Pakistan, including hunting down so-called high-value targets and conducting raids with Pakistani forces in North and South Waziristan. These actions are carried out in secret and have been publicly denied by senior Pentagon and State Department officials who have stated that there are no U.S. troops in Pakistan or that the only role of U.S. troops there is to train Pakistani forces. Such statements have been made recently by Ambassador Richard Holbrook and Pentagon spokesperson Jeff Morrell. Their statements are demonstrably false. U.S. officials have consistently misled the American public and the Pakistani people on the extent of U.S. military operations in Pakistan. If Congress is kept in the dark about these operations, Mr. Chairman, how can it expect to honestly and effectively debate U.S. policy on Pakistan? One of the most off-the-radar wars the U.S. is currently waging is in the Horn of Africa and the Gulf of Aden, where U.S. forces are increasingly attacking forces from al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula. As with the presence of U.S. forces in Pakistan, publicly the Obama administration insists that its role in Yemen is limited to training and equipping the country's military forces. This is false. On multiple occasions, the United States has launched cruise missiles carrying cluster bombs at villages in Yemen, killing scores of people, among them women and children. Two such attacks took place last December. One of them was reportedly aimed at targeting a U.S. citizen, Anwar al-Awlaki, to execute him without trial. Special operations sources have told me that elite U.S. special ops have also engaged in lethal ground operations directly in Yemen. As in the case of the U.S. drone strikes in Pakistan, the Yemeni authorities are colluding with American officials to cover up and mask the extent of U.S. involvement. In a meeting with General David Petraeus in early January of 2010, Yemen's president reportedly told the general, quote, we'll continue saying the bombs are ours, not yours. U.S. Special Ops Forces have launched at least six attacks on Somalia in recent years, including multiple helicopter assaults and Tomahawk missile attacks. The most recent operation we know of in Somalia was a helicopter attack in September 2009 under the current President's command. These ongoing shadow wars, Mr. Chairman, confirm an open secret that few in Congress are willing to discuss publicly, particularly Democrats. When it comes to U.S. counterterrorism policy, there has been almost no substantive change from the Bush to the Obama administration. In fact, my sources within the CIA and the special operations community tell me that if there's any change, it's that President Obama is hitting harder, hitting in more countries than President Bush. The Obama administration is expanding covert actions of the military and the number of countries where U.S. special forces are operating. The administration has taken the Bush era doctrine that the world is a battlefield, a favorite of the neocons, and run with it and widened its scope. Under the Bush administration, special forces were in 60 countries around the world. Under President Obama, they're in 75. As a special operations veteran told me, President Obama has, quote, let U.S. special operations forces off the leash. As I just returned from Afghanistan, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to share with this committee part of my investigation into deadly U.S. night raids in that country where innocent civilians were killed. These operations carried out by the same special ops teams that operate in Yemen, Pakistan, and Somalia are part of what is effectively a shadow war within the more publicly visible war in Afghanistan. In one incident in February of this year, U.S. Special Operations Forces raided a civilian compound in the Gardez district of Pakhtia province. They killed two pregnant women, a teenage girl, and two men. U.S. forces tried to cover up their responsibility for the killings and blamed the Taliban and said the women were executed in an honor killing. That was a blatant lie, Mr. Chairman, and eventually the U.S. was forced to admit its responsibility. These innocent Afghans were killed by soldiers from the Joint Special Operations Command. I went to visit with that family in their home in Gardez. They were pro-American and anti-Taliban before this raid. In fact, the night U.S. forces stormed their compound, they thought it was a Taliban attack. The two men who were killed were actively working with U.S. forces. One of them was a top police commander trained by the United States. The other was a local prosecutor in the Karzai government. One man who saw his pregnant wife gunned down by U.S. forces was hooded and handcuffed 
and taken prisoner for days by American forces. When he was released, he told me he wanted to become a suicide bomber and blow himself up among the Americans. To date, the only remedy that the United States has offered this family were two sheep for them to sacrifice. Similar story happened when I visited Nangahar province. U.S. forces raided the Kashkaki family's compound in May of 2010, killing eight civilians. Local police officials told me the family had no connection to the Taliban. That family is left asking why they should su support the U.S. presence in their country after watching their loved ones shot dead before their eyes by a military that claims to be there to liberate them and free their country. These raids and the civilian deaths they cause are hardly isolated incidents. In closing, Mr. Chairman, I told both of these families targeted in those raids that I described that I bring their cases before the U.S. Congress and ask that they be investigated and that those responsible be held accountable. On behalf of those families, I humbly ask this committee to consider this request. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Well, I will, and I, I would like to get the details on both of them. And would you also, uh, when you submit, would you identify the 75 nations that you say we've gone up from 60 to 75? Mr. Chairman, that, uh, that information remains classified. I, I've been able to, to gather about a dozen of them from special operations sources, but I, I'll submit to you the information that I have thus far and documentation to support the 75 statistic. Thank you very much. I now am very pleased to introduce uh, as our next witness, Bruce Fine. For years, he served as assistant director of the Office of Legal Policy legal advisor to the Assistant Attorney General for Antitrust and the Associate Deputy Attorney General of the United States. Mr. Fine has also served as the General Counsel of the Federal Communications Commission, followed by an appointment as Research Director for the Joint Congressional Committee on Covert Arms Sales to Iran. And I hesitate to add this, but he also is a graduate from Harvard Law School with honors. But we welcome you, uh, Bruce Fine, to this hearing. Thank you, you, Mr. Chairman. The law reflects the moral deposit of the time. And I think the issue that you've raised at this hearing, civil liberties and national security, uh, represents a revolution for the worse in the American political culture and psychology. The United States was born with the idea that the individual was the center of the universe and due process was to be praised and venerated above all else. And the reason wasn't to win foreign allies and international support, although that was a, you know, a, something that would not be uh, unwelcome, but it was because of who we are as a people. Who we are as a people do we care about freedom more than absolute safety? Do we care about due process more than domination for the sake of domination? And I think I'd like to illustrate the degradation in our political culture uh, to a way that we resemble more uh, China and Russia than we do the United States in 1776 or 1787 by some comparisons. I think the first is, are we at war? It is the characteristic of all empires to inflate danger from a reasonable level uh, into thousands or millions of times above that level in order to justify an extra increment of safety. And if you examine today the enemy to soldier ratio of the United States and Afghanistan and Pakistan, and our CIA and counterterrorism experts estimate we have 50 to 100 al-Qaeda in Afghanistan at present, maybe 300 in Pakistan. If you take that current enemy to soldier ratio and apply it to what our armed forces would have looked like in World War II fighting Japan and Germany, we would have fielded a military of three and a half billion soldiers, including conscripting every single American. We would have to multiply the population by 126. And our enemies in World War II were not those who were in caves and had primitive access to technology or weapons. These were people in Germany and Japan building V-1, V-2 rockets, zero airplanes, kamikaze pilots, et cetera. And yet we did not suspend due process of law. In my judgment, one of the greatest um, uh, errors that we've made in addressing this whole issue is to conclude that 9-11 
did cross the threshold of danger that put us at war and that's very critical uh, mr chairman because war is very unique because it makes what's customary murder legal that doesn't mean it should never happen but that's a very grave step to take what is customarily murder becomes legal and that is where we are today with i think the authorization to use military force and really without much debate or discourse at all saying al qaeda represents that level of danger that justifies moving from a criminal justice system to where we treat these people as international thugs and dangers to being warriors uh, subject to the rules of war uh, but that's just one example another example if we look at where we were at the outset and where we are today you remember the Boston Massacre, and we had someone named John Adams, and he was a lawyer. And he defended some of the British soldiers who were accused of massacring, protesting Americans at the time. And he was placed under much criticism. He was actually defending the rule of law. And he won acquittal from that, those British soldiers. He later became a president of the United States. He was the first vice president as well. Today, this culture treats those who would defend those accused of crime. If you call them a terrorist crime, would you get elected president? No, you get on the banned list. No one should hire you. You should be treated as a pariah if you're defending the rule of law. Indeed, we've do lowered to the situation where we've had a former solicitor general of the United States say that someone who defends an organization allegedly listed as a false wrong as a foreign terrorist organization to provide legal assistance is a material assistance prohibited under a material assistance law. Now, that sounds like a lawyer practicing in Russia or in China, not the United States of America. Now, let me give you the uh, odyssey of Khalid al-Masri to show again how far we have come in degrading the rule of law. Khalid al-Masri was a German citizen of Lebanese ancestry. And after 9-11, he was picked up, kidnapped, if you will, from Macedonia, taken to Afghanistan, imprisoned there. He was tortured. He was abused. He was dumped back in Albania. Uh, all of this never being accused of any crime whatsoever. In Germany, there were 13 arrest warrants that were initially issued in order to try to bring to justice uh, CIA operatives. The United States of America urged uh, and exhorted the Germans to stop. Don't go this far. You'll upset the p international opinion towards us. Uh, the rule of law should be crucified on a national security cross. And those arrest warrants were then never executed. Uh, Mr. El Masri then comes to the United States and he brings a lawsuit claiming that, his, that the Constitution has been violated and he's suing uh, CIA director, uh, then George Tenet, and others uh, for constitutional violations of his rights. And what is he confronted with? State secrets privilege. You can't prosecute your case, the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Fourth Circuit said, because if you'll have to disclose who the culprits were who tortured and beat you, and that'll disclose intelligence sources and methods, therefore you're out of court. And that kind of catch-22, again, it smacks of Soviet or Chinese justice. This is the United States of America. And this is what happened to Mr. El El Khalid El Masri, just one example. If we were to read in the newspapers that Vladimir Putin could put on a list, you know, Russians who he thought uh, Mr. Berkovsky or others uh, who are outside a list to be assassinated because he thought they were endangering political stability in Russia. We would think, what a monstrosity. This shows how bad and lawless Russia is. They really haven't changed since Gorbachev left. And yet here we have today a president of the United States claiming identical authority, unilaterally authorized to identify an American citizen abroad, no judicial review, no congressional oversight, you are on an assassination list because I am declaring that you are an imminent threat to the United States. He's not on a battlefield. He's not engaged in active hostilities against the United States. There's no due process whatsoever. Indeed, just two days ago, a U.S. district court here held, well, there's no way that the judiciary can review this particular power. Only Congress can do it. Only Congress can do it. And I want to take back, Mr. Chairman, the days when I think you and I were here some 30 or 40 years ago concerning President Nixon's impeachment and to examine how, again, far we have fallen since those times. You remember those three articles of impeachment that were voted by the House Judiciary Committee? They were strong, and Barbara Jordan was there. One of one, 
he, President Nixon, had failed to faithfully execute the laws. There are law violations that he knew about, and he was not faithfully executing laws indeed. With the tapes, we heard he was encouraging obstruction of justice, etc. And he was impeached for that. And as you pointed out in your opening statement, we have a president now who sees out there waterboarding torture. He knows the people who are complicit because they've confessed. Now, there's no exception in Article 2 of the Constitution to decline to faithfully execute the laws because it would be politically difficult. No exception. Indeed, if there is some awkwardness, there is a remedy, if you will. It's the, called the pardon power. President Ford, as you well know and remember, Chairman Conyers, decided he would pardon Richard Nixon because he thought the country would be too convulsed with a trial. But he took accountability. A pardon requires the recipient to acknowledge guilt or wrongdoing, and it does not then wound the rule of law. If you just shut your eyes to violations of law at the most heinous sort, is a flagrant violation of that duty to faithfully execute the law, and yet nothing happens. Let's go to another area. Another article of impeachment against Richard Nixon was obstruction of justice. Remember the 18-minute gap and all the, the things that disappeared? Obstruction of justice. As you point out, we have open acknowledgment that those interrogation videotapes were destroyed. And what happened? Nothing. Nothing. Where is the oversight? That's an unflagging obligation to enforce the laws. I go back. If you don't think it would be politically healthy, you have to pardon them. And pardoning requires the recipient to say, I did wrong. Third article of impeachment was flouting a congressional subpoena, an impeachable offense. Today it happens every day. You know, you, uh, Mr. Chairman, you had to go to court. Ultimately, you won at the district level, and it became moot because the Congress expired, et cetera, had to fight the case again. This administration, previous administration, ignores subpoenas all the time. I don't want to answer. It doesn't even have to be classified information, sensitive information. We don't want to tell you. That's why you know more about the United States from reading WikiLeaks than you get in classified briefings from this executive branch and previous ones. It is not a partisan issue. It transcends politics. And then we, we had Mr. Sensenbrenner talk uh, with, I think, uh, uh, rather um, uh, a breezy air about these national security letters. These are letters that the FBI and others can issue unilaterally, no judicial review. If you say that some investigation has any relation to terrorism, which can be anything under the sun, and today when we're um, at least semi entrapping 18 and 19 year olds uh, that we read in the newspapers to plan bomb plots or whatever, you know, a terrorism investigation can cover the waterfront. And even with that breadth, their own inspector general in the Justice Department said it was violated thousands of times where there's not proper certification given. Um, these kinds of uh, infringements. In our day, Mr. Chairman, it was called the Houston Plan. And the Houston Plan was rejected even by J. Edgar Hoover. By J. Edgar Hoover says this is not acceptable in the United States. He then becomes a civil libertarian like John Ashcroft, you know, in the hospital, where at least he wouldn't do some of the things in flouting the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act that the Bush administration wanted. Uh, and perhaps to me most shocking, although the incidents are so numerous you get numb to them, was a statement made by a member of Congress, and I won't identify him, after the verdict up in New York on one of the alleged, uh, those complicit in the bombings in Tanzania and Kenyan embassy, where the gist of his statement was, we can't have trials if you're going to have not guilty verdicts. We only do trials if you know you're going to bring in guilty and punish them. You know, this is like a world of Joe Stalin. You only have show trials. Due process isn't there to try to ferret out what's truthful and what is not, who is innocent and is not guilty. You know, the fact that a statement like that could be made from someone whose oath of office is to uphold and defend the Constitution of the United States, and it goes unremarked, is truly shocking. Truly shocking. And the last example I want to give, and I was involved in some sense as amicus curiae, concerns our treatment of Uyghurs. Now, it may sound very exotic. Uyghurs are an ethnic minority in northeast China. They're Muslims. And there was about two dozen of them were detained at Guantanamo Bay. 
two dozen were detained at Guantanamo Bay, allegedly enemy combatants, although they despise communist China, never threatened Americans ever. But they were said to be enemy combatants because they trained on the same field that Osama bin Laden once put a foot on as his car drove over. They were there for almost eight years. Finally, the Supreme Court gave them habeas corpus in the Bomidian case. They come to the district court here, and the Justice Department finally says, this is Obama. We really don't have any evidence that they're enemy combatants at all. We have no evidence. Really, they've been detained illegally for seven years. The judge says, well, I guess they should come to the United States. Indeed, their leader, semi-leader, is a woman called Rebbe Kadir, who's received the Nobel Peace Prize nomination three times. Her office is a caddy quarter from the White House. She says, well, I'll take care of them. They're only 17. I'll give you my bond that there won't become public charges. And the Obama administration says, no, they're illegal aliens. They don't have green cards, can't come to the United States. They have to go back and rot in Guantanamo, even though they're being held illegally. And that argument prevailed in the executive branch. The case went up on appeal. And meanwhile, the, just, the United States of America then shocked the world, offering bribes or others. Would you please take these Uyghurs off our hands? We don't want them here. We're frightened. The Chinese might not buy our bonds. So we will then sell their liberty to somebody else. Uh, Vanuatu or the Baha Bermuda or something like that. Now, that's what the United States has come to. It has come to resemble the King George III monarchy, the tyrannies that we were fighting about. And this is not something that is a trade-off between civil liberties and national security. The greatest national security of any nation is the loyalty of its people, its devotion to the country because it respects the rule of law. The British may thought that they were getting security when they quartered soldiers in American colonists' homes, when they issued writs of assistance, when they impressed U.S. seamen, American seamen, into their own navy, and they ended up with a revolution. They lost everything. That's what the French thought, too, on the eve of the French Revolution. The escalation of the oppression of freedom ends up endangering the state rather than making it more secure. And on that score, as when stated as by my previous witness, we also, by acting in a lawless way abroad, are creating more enemies than we're killing. We're making ourselves less safe. We have the illusion with the body count that, oh, yes, now I don't feel quite as fearful as tomorrow. There'll be a caliphate in Washington, D.C. But ultimately, uh, Mr. Chairman, this will change only if our political culture and our leadership changes to say, we prefer freedom to absolute safety. Now is the time to understand our goal is not an empire to restore the individual and freedom as a center of our constitutional universe, and other things are subordinate to that overriding goal. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, sir. Uh, you six witnesses have uh, provided us with uh, some of the most important discussion that the Judiciary Committee has held in the 111th session. I'm grateful to you. There, I'm going to. I'm going to ask you now, uh, starting with Ambassador Pickering. Um, where do you think we ought to, or how might um, members of the legislative branch and citizens? Uh, begin to weigh in on a discussion uh, such as the one that's been held here this morning that many people are going to look much further into and become more aware of some of these uh, tensions between uh, constitution, constitutional liberties and security. Mr. Chairman, that's an important and significant challenge. Uh, all of us, I think, have great respect for the committee and great respect for your work and role, are hesitated to provide prescriptory ideas, but let me begin with a few. I think you have several powers that are very important here. One, the simplest and the easiest, but perhaps one of the most effective is the simple power of reporting, reporting to your fellow 
members of congress reporting to the public reporting in that way to the executive branch about the areas that you're concerned about i particularly express my concern about the issue of the use of article three courts and the concern i had that military commissions and other substitutes if they were not equal to article three courts in their protection of the rights of the individual would be failing to meet the constitutional norms i'm concerned about detention without trial on an indefinite basis some of us have suggested some ways to proceed i'm concerned about the protection of privacy while at the same time obviously administering effectively the law and security and the adequate control of trade and commerce i'm concerned about the exercise of state immunity as a blanket way to evade the use of the judicial process to find redress for issues and problems that come up that are otherwise open to citizens of this country the second question that you have to face and the second important power you have as individual members is to institute legislation where you feel legislative remedies may be required to deal with the problem i don't have in mind specific remedial legislation others may have but it is an important activity the third is obviously what you're doing here today bringing people together who have an interest in this problem we don't all have unanimity of views obviously but we have serious concerns about what we see is the derogation of constitutional rights and privileges and the creation of sets of activities which could well lead to serious abuses now and in the future of the human rights of our citizens and indeed all others who enjoy rights under our constitution and those kinds of activities i think coming together can provide a both a powerful voice and institutionally a powerful set of arrangements to correct what we believe have been abuses and tendencies to continue and expand abuses of these particular actions on the part of the executive branch thank you very much i'd like to ask my two witnesses professor lewis and attorney jasser in a hearing like this do you see any recommendations or do any suggestions come to your mind about ways that we might be able to improve the delivery of justice and fairness in this country both in our courts and in between and in relationship between the three branches of government here and with the countries and the peoples of the world have you been thinking about that at all and as with with ambassador pickering i would always cautious to uh to suggest uh prescriptive uh ideas uh for congress but i i do think that with respect to the question how to deal with with guantanamo be detainees that the system is broken right we're trying folks in federal court and yet we're saying if they're not convicted we're going to continue to detain them well that may actually make a lot of sense because these are folks who uh have engaged in war against the united states they um have gone through a review process and this administration and prior administration determined that these individuals are of the highest value and should be uh, continue to be detained and so it makes sense that if they're not convicted that we're going to need to keep them off the battlefield particularly when folks are returning at high rates but then you have to ask yourself well perhaps we should be looking at a different judicial system that uh doesn't ensure convictions that's not that's not what folks are looking for but that sets the balance differently than we do in the criminal justice system where instead of the default presumption being innocence and and complete you know it, we can we we will we let 99 guilty men off in order to ensure that one innocent isn't convicted perhaps it makes sense to try a different set of rules uh, certainly we don't want to abandon the presumption of innocence that's not what i'm suggesting what i'm suggesting however is uh, a set of 
a set of rules that make sense in the context of war, uh, a set of judges who have, who have been through the federal system, who are confirmed by the Senate, nominated by the President, prosecutors, career prosecutors from the Department of Justice, clear defense counsels who have high-level security clearances, a system that makes, makes sense and yet can be seen to do justice um, without the problems raised by our current criminal justice system, without the challenges of security issues, classified information issues, um, and all those uh, concomitant challenges that we've talked about earlier today. Uh, Attorney Jaffer, before you begin, Professor Lewis, let me ask you, uh, isn't there a possibility that among those 70, there may be some that even you and I could agree ought be released and that, that there are not appropriate charges to bring against them? Well, uh, Chairman Kiner, certainly um, there's the possibility that among that, the remaining 170 that there are folks who deserve to be released. I would note that the uh, current administration, when it first came in, appointed a, a terrific team of lawyers at the National Security Division, many folks that I worked with, uh, headed by Matt Olson, currently the General Counsel of the National Security Agency, um, a, a gentleman who I worked with, I have a tremendous amount of respect for, um, who actually did this, the very review that you're, that you're talking about. And so I'd be hard pressed to question that review. I certainly, Congress should take a close uh, look at the results of that review. Um, but given that they spent a lot of time looking at the classified information, working with analysts from CIA, DIA, the National Security Agency, working with the operators, and actually recommended a number of folks to be released, okay. um, and then a number of folks to be detained, uh, continued detention, and some for prosecution, um, I think it makes a lot of sense, the process that's been gone through. The question now becomes, what happens with those detainees um, who we've determined are either too high value to be released, and or we simply don't have the kind of evidence that would work in a federal court? What do you do with those folks? The basic options are currently are military commissions, um, or just detention without any sort of trial. Um, a national security court might be an op option that presents some of the benefits of federal court uh, without, the, uh, without the public perception issues associated with the military commission. Well, what, what are the problems that you envision could happen in a uh, federal court that, that, that create a little bit of apprehension in your mind about them being the uh, appropriate court of jurisdiction? Sure. Well, you know, the evidentiary rules. I mean, they're, they're nothing. I mean, that, that, that's the same court with the same set of rules that Americans are called upon to, uh, to visit and that we create the laws for and that we select the judges for every, almost every day in the year. Absolutely, and, and all, all, the only thing I mean to suggest is that is, is it's a policy question. These folks don't have the same constitutional rights that folks in this country have. And so the question becomes, as a matter of policy, do we want to put these detainees uh, in federal court and give them the same rights and benefits that Americans have, including this very strong bias against conviction, this very strong bias uh, against putting, a, 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 you know, a, a, you know, sacrificing 99 guilty, letting them on the street. Uh, for well, the well, well, we're not we're not playing the numbers game. Here's here's what I'm suggesting that. Uh, going through uh, a Title III court, uh, we would have to prove their guilt. What's wrong with that? There's nothing wrong with that, and I actually think that it makes a lot of sense to have to prove the guilt of folks that we want to detain, particularly beyond the duration of hostilities. Certainly, there are folks at Guantanamo Bay who we don't ever want to be, have to see released, including after the current set of hostilities, the immediate set of hostilities ends, uh, because they've killed Americans and deserve perhaps a life sentence, perhaps even the death penalty. Uh, who, who's who determined who's determined that? So, so for so for example, an individual like Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, who's been accused of crimes, right? That that would suggest a life sentence or, or the death penalty. <clears throat> Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, we 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 would want to, if we believe that in fact he is guilty of those crimes, which he's been accused of, um, to be detained and incarcerated beyond the scope of any hostilities ongoing. And so the question becomes, you've got to find a way to do that. And the federal courts are one option, certainly. And it's an option that applies to American citizens, applies to folks inside the United States. And that's, it, it's, it's, not a, it's not a crazy option, it's a very, it's a very reasonable option. Mm -hmm. The problem is there are huge challenges with using the federal court, both to the safety of the folks in New York, to the, to the jurors who might be called, the judges, the classified information that would be used to convict Mr. Muhammad. I well, mean, what's the problem? I mean, sure, all of that would, would happen, but 
what dangers do, does that present to you in terms of determining guilt or innocence? Well, imagine a world in which uh, the evidence obtained uh, that we have against Mr. Muhammad was obtained in ways that uh, wouldn't satisfy. Were, it, were illegal. Well, no, put, 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 aside, put, aside, put aside enhanced interrogation um, for the sake of argument. Take the example of information obtained in Afghanistan, bad chain of custody, obtained on the, on the battlefield of war. Um, you know, that evidence you'd want brought before. Would, would you want torch, uh, evidence uh, that was uh, gained by torture to be uh, usable against terrorists? Well, I think that we have to look at the evidence that's obtained and- You wouldn't want, you wouldn't want that, would you? I, I don't think we should be torturing people. And I've, 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 I, would, I would never support the use of torture against- uh, and, and you wouldn't want people whose evidence was secured through torture to be found guilty on that, on the basis of that evidence. Well, or, or water torture, for example. You, you don't support that. Well, Mr. Uh, Chairman Collier, certainly I don't think that if, if we are torturing folks, we should not be doing that. And, um, you know, there, there are a lot of concerns about the enhanced interrogation techniques um, that, that were used in the CIA program. Nobody can doubt that. A lot of people talk a lot about waterboarding. There are other techniques that have now been publicly released by the, by the current administration. That are probably the, just as bad. Walling, sleep yeah. deprivation. Um, at the same time. Well, what, what, what would you do with evidence gained through, the, through those techniques well, if those, in if a those, court? If those techniques constitute torture under the laws of the United States, and that's a legal question, right? one that uh, no court has yet determined and one that, uh, that different po folks disagree about. Well, on the contrary, it's been determined, uh, waterboarding has been determined pretty definitively as not being appropriate. And, and uh, for, for all that we can determine, it is ordered to have been stopped. And we don't have any reports that it is still going on. Do you know of any? No, Mr. Chairman, in fact, in fact, uh, what, what's the, the, the uh, both administrations have indicated clearly that only three individuals are subject to waterboarding. Um, and they've disclosed the names of those individuals, including the, the number of applications of waterboarding. So it's been, it was a very, that particular technique, obviously being on the farthest edge of the enhanced interrogation techniques uh, that, that, that were used in the CIA program. The, the sort of least invasive being perhaps the facial slap, right, all the way to the waterboard. And there were a number of techniques in between uh, has now been declassified by the administration. Um, the, the real real concern here, though, is, you know, when we're looking at these techniques, uh, you, you know, people of reasonable minds, put aside the sort of extre the very extreme techniques and take other techniques that may be used, uh, whether, it's, whether it's the ones that are approved in the Army Field Manual or others. There are people of reasonable minds will disagree about whether those techniques should be used in a free society like America. And there's no doubt that that disagreement is a valid, reasonable disagreement to have. The question then becomes, what happens when a technique you don't like whether it's an extreme technique, and put aside, again, the, the most extreme, but, but sort of an, an, an enhanced technique that even, that sort of we don't think is- Well, well in other words, you, you might see your way to endorse uh, modestly enhanced techniques. Well, I, I think that could there that, are- Could that satisfy your, your sense of fairness? Well, Mr. Chairman, I think that's, that's certainly a, a decision well above my pay grade, um, and it's certainly- Well, no, it's, it's a decision that each of us can individually possess that might, yours might be different from someone else's, but it, it doesn't make it uh, any less uh, important to you. Well, Mr. Chairman, I think what I, I, think what I would say is, um, you know, the, the CIA program yielded the most highly valuable intelligence gained in the war on terror, period, bar none. Uh, there is no question that the information gained from that program, whether you agree or disagree with the techniques used, yeah. Um, but the fact that they were detained, held um, as high-value detainees, and uh, were questioned um, in a particular circumstance, uh, set of circumstances led to the further capture of some of the highest-value detainees that we have in our custody. Um, and the biggest, uh, the biggest efforts against the Al-Qaeda network. And so, um, you know, I don't, I'm not sure that I know which techniques are good. Well, why, why is it that judges uh, seem to be prone to not allow admissible evidence uh, from uh, witnesses who have been subject to enhanced uh, interrogation. Are they soft-headed or s sentimental or uh, what, what's, what's, what's the problem here? Not at all. We have a long history in this country of excluding 
evidence obtained from coercion. Because we don't think, we, A, we don't think coercion is right, and B, we don't think necessarily that the information obtained from coercion is reliable. And neither do you. And I, I, and I, and I think that there are serious questions there. And there are serious questions about whether information obtained from coercion is reliable. And there are serious questions about whether these are techniques that we want used in America, in a free country. Could you understand how a person subject to these kinds of techniques would say anything that anybody wanted them to say? Absolutely. Absolutely. There's, there's a, no doubt that the history of use of coercive techniques has suggested that there are serious issues with the information obtained from such coercion. That being said, there's also no question that the folks who went through the, the, the CIA program yielded tremendously valuable, accurate intelligence, actionable intelligence that we acted upon and protected this nation. Right? There are now, as part of the release of the CIA memos, other documents were released at the request of the previous administration that evidence that information obtained from individuals in U.S. custody as part of the CIA and other detainee programs allowed us to protect the nation from actual, ongoing, day-to-day -day plots. Well, let me, let me uh, summarize here, because I want to recognize Laura Murphy, uh, and then I'm coming back to, prof to Professor Lewis. Uh, would you be willing to submit uh, at, at your earliest convenience uh, a, a list of uh, cases in which uh, there was known enhanced interrogation or torture used in which the witness elicited valuable and correct information. Question, Mr. Miller. Yes, sir, um, that's for you, Attorney I, Jaffer. I, I am not aware, you know, the, the information that has been declassified by the current administration is very limited uh, with respect to the, the information obtained. Um, well, I don't, I, don't, I don't want uh, classified information, although I'm cleared for it, maybe uh, several hundred million Americans may not be. And I, I'm no longer cleared for it either, Mr. Chairman, and so well, I would note that- So let's take that off, let's take that off. We're talking about uh, trials or evidentiary proceedings or investigations in which uh, enhanced torture, in enhanced interrogation or torture revealed uh, valuable and important and accurate information. Well, well Mr. Chairman, I, I, would, I would just say, if even just look at the CIA, the, the, the agency's program alone, as we know, Abu Zubaydah, who was subjected to uh, extreme uh, to enhanced interrogation techniques, including including the waterboard, um, ultimately gave us information that led to Khalid Sheikh Mohammed. That much has been declassified and is in the public record. Um, so I, I can't I, I can't speak to whether uh, you know. Uh, in, in the entire history of the, the criminal justice system, we have found uh, folks who have been, who have given- Neither them. can I, that's well, why no. I'm asking you. And, and, and I, and I, and I sh but I share the concern, Mr. Chairman. I, okay. I completely- Then we, we agree that th it would be pretty difficult to do. We, absolutely, Mr. Chairman, we agree on that. And, and I, I, let me be clear, I do not support the use of coerced testimony, okay? Nor do I support the use of techniques that constitute torture or anything even approaching that, Mr. Chairman. What I, what I do support, how, what I do want to note though, however, is that this program that, that, that the CIA engaged in, where they held high value detainees abroad and, and sat down with them and went through these issues, yielded tremendously valuable intelligence that protected America from ongoing plots. There can be no doubt about that. The public record on that is clear. It's not as wholesome as one might, as one might hope. One might hope for even more information that would allow us to really judge the program, right? And perhaps this administration will declassify additional information if appropriate. But I guess my concern is that when you're looking at this class of information, uh, to declassify it, you must step very, very cautiously. And I would submit that even some of the declassification that's taken place to date has been, has been uh, perhaps unnecessary. So uh, it may be necessary to say, look, here are the techniques that were used in the program. But to give a detailed prescription, how many degrees you incline somebody's head, what amounts of water you, you, might, you might use. I mean, this is just a, a, a recipe for how to torture Americans, right? Or, to, or to, how, to, how to use enhanced terrorist techniques against Americans uh, in, in more aggressively, right? Um, if you believe that such techniques constitute torture, right? So if you're a person who believes wa the water board is torture, right? And, 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 and I think most people tend to feel that it's, it's, it's the most extreme of the enhanced segregation techniques, you know, whether you use the term torture or whatever to describe it, right? Why would you then 
give everybody in the world, including our enemies, a detailed recipe on how to carry that out. It seems, what is the national security benefit of that? Ambassador Pickering, you, you seem disturbed, and I'd like to recognize you before I, I go on. Well, it followed with interest the line of questioning, Mr. Chairman. I have two concerns. One, the federal court does not answer the question, at least in terms of how it's been explained, the new federal court idea of what to do about detainees who are not convicted. So we know that that's a problem. Yeah. Secondly, I personally have no objection to finding useful ways to bring together the, ju the judicial system with the protection of classified information. And we have statute that does that. If Mr. Jaffer feels that's inadequate, then maybe there's an opportunity here to propose something for your dialectation that would, in fact, improve that particular process. We have no objection to that. At least I have no objection to that. I have a serious concern that if, with all the euphemisms that have been used, the new federal court is designed to prejudice the trial in a way to assure conviction uh, by denying rights that are otherwise available to Americans and others under our judicial system, then I have an objection. Why not just use the Article III courts? If it's an attempt to get halfway between the old military commission struck down by the Supreme Court and the Article III courts, uh, then we're, in a sense, moving in the right direction, but not sufficiently, in my view. And so those remain, of course. The whole question of torture and its role, I addressed in a few brief words. I'm not the expert on this issue. I've read a lot about it. I'm convinced it's a highly unreliable and reprehensible technique and that it shouldn't be used that it has muddied the process of bringing people who, with every other piece of evidence, are undoubtedly convictable in court. Yeah. And it has a result as it has destroyed the capacity to deal with that set of issues. I would think it would require an act of the most careful, painstaking, and infinitely detailed kind of research with total access to every, every interchange with the gentlemen concerned who've been subject to these techniques to begin to make head or tails out of whether a particular technique, a particular line of questioning produced a particular result. I know from what I have read that experienced interrogators find the use of uh, these kinds of techniques in the main as destroying their capacity to affect the kind of relationship with the person being interrogated that produces the kind of useful information that's very valuable. Uh, but I think your question is entirely germane. It's an extremely useful one, but I think it points down the road of the frustration of yeah. trying to find the answer to this question under any circumstances that we can conceive of. Has this particular set of techniques produced the reliable sort of information that is the kind of silver bullet that Mr. Joffer would like to have us believe is in fact the product of this, but where everything else is in uh, an inscrutable and unopenable black box. Attorney Bruce Fine. I'd like to make three observations about Mr. Jaffer's remarks, which I find a little frightening. Uh, first, I think it's specious to say because torture or waterboarding was used and then some information by that individual who was interrogated was useful, therefore only the torture was the way to bring it about. Because, as I think Ambassador Pickering pointed out, there are those skilled interrogators who said, well, many of these uh, individuals were giving useful information before the waterboarding occurred, and there's no reason why they couldn't have gotten the information otherwise. But putting that aside, there really is no limit, I see, uh, principle to stopping at waterboarding. How about the rack and screw? How about threatening the family of the individual and say we're going to kill your son or your daughter? If everything is subordinate to trying to get reliable information, then we have lost our, our, our um, uh, uh, badge of being civilized people. Anything goes. And then the last thing that's also very troublesome is we do not have a culture whereby you could have a deterrent effect on these heinous techniques because even though you could use the information against the alleged terrorist, you prosecuted the individual who was violating our own laws in the process. Because we have a situation where they act with impunity. 
And Mr. Jaffer didn't say, well, we should be prosecuting those who used waterboarding or, th or things that violated our laws that this Congress enacted. It was just like they washed out of the picture. But if you want to have any deterrence right now, the only way you get it is by excluding that evidence at a criminal trial. The, the ever patient Laura Murphy. <laughs> you see me wiggling over here. Um, uh, Mr. Chair, I don't even know where to begin with some of these ideas. Our Article Three courts are in great shape. They've worked for over 150 years. We have the Classified Information Procedures Act that is working. We need to prosecute terrorists in Article Three courts. We elevate them as war heroes when we try to use military commissions that are deeply flawed, that allow hearsay evidence, that have not been tested through the Supreme Court process. Military commissions have uh, tried five people. The Justice Department has prosecuted over 400 people in Article III courts. We need accountability for terrorism. We know that terrorism, I'm sorry, for torture. We know that torture is illegal. We need to get to make sure that Mr. Durham uh, fully investigates people all the way up the food chain um, in the former administration who authorized this. The president, the former president can walk around with impunity and say that he gladly authorized waterboarding. It's just an insult and an offense to our, our values and to the, the treaty obligations that we hold dear in our American law and jurisprudence. But the other thing I wanted to go back to your first question about what should you do, I think that if you recall those days right after 9-11, uh, we worked very closely together, Mr. Chairman, and the Congress was put under so much pressure not to hold hearings. And you and Mr. Sensenbrenner figured out how to hold hearings nonetheless. We need hearings on the Patriot Act, and we need to start as soon as possible. There are many abuses of the Patriot Act that are still unresolved. There are a number of Inspector General reports that specifically go to the use of national security letters where the FBI has egregiously violated uh, the statute. There's Section 215 that needs to be fixed. There's the lone wolf provision, which the Justice Department says it rarely, if ever, uses. And so I think we need a strong, we need to start the 112th Congress with a strong defense of Article III courts. We need to get ready for the Patriot Act reauthorization as soon as possible. And even though you don't, may, you won't, will not control the hearings, Mr. Conyers, I think it's very important that we host conversations. And there will bipartisan discussions about the Patriot Act, patriots defending the Bill of Rights. There are organizations and institutions that want to work in a bipartisan fashion to look at the Patriot Act, reopen it, and make sure that Congress has serious consideration. And the last thing that I, I will say is this whole issue around the authorization for the use of military force makes the issues that you've just been discussing go on steroids. It, we will be confronted with so many new challenges if this Congress uh, abrogates its responsibility and just quickly expands uh, a declaration of war. The, the, the Constitution gave the United States the Congress to declare war for a reason. And so if there's any expansion of our war effort away from the original authorization of, of the use of military force, Congress should have very, very detailed hearings about that. And you will be under particular pressure, Mr. Conyers, because Chairman uh, Buck McKeon has said, incoming Chairman Buck McKeon has said that he wants to push this in the Armed Services Committee. Uh, incoming Chairman Lamar Smith said that he wants to look at this. Uh, Senator Lindsey Graham has said that he's going to push for this. So you will be confronted in very short order at the very beginning of the next Congress with several issues. So accountability for torture, uh, taking the reauthorization of the Patriot Act seriously, making sure that there is no expansion of the authorization for the use of military force are just three issues. And you have a remarkable track record of bringing groups together from all sides of the aisle. And even if you don't have hearings, you should have meetings. You should invite us in to meet with you and to uh, brief 
members of, of your side of the aisle, if at all possible. But we can have forums. Uh, Absolutely. Which are Public not official forums. meetings. And that's what we did when, it, when we had the Patriot Act. Remember, the, uh, the leadership of the House refused to give you the permission to hold those hearings, but you held them anyway. And they were highly I attended. think they were down in the basement they somewhere. Were. They were in the basement of the Rayburn Building. But that's what we're going to have to go back to. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I now turn to Professor Michael Lewis, who's been very patient. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I wanted to mention one thing Mr. Fine had said about uh, the information obtained from Abu Zubaydah using waterboarding. Uh, he'd said that there's no evidence that the tort, that the use of that technique was the result. But the fact of the matter is that Zubaydah had resisted all his other techniques. He had been in the hands of trained interrogators for long periods of time without having given up the information that eventually led to the capture of Khalid Sheikh Mohammed. It was only after he was waterboarded that that occurred. Now, having said all that, th there's no question that enhanced interrogation techniques and information obtained from them should have, has no place in criminal courts or criminal trials. Uh, however, it, that doesn't mean that it's not effective in intelligence gathering. That those are two separate issues and in two separate uh, ways in which, or reasons for using the technique. And so you may have a need to gather intelligence in a short period of time that, that might include the use of enhanced interrogation techniques However, those cannot possibly be used to convict the people afterwards. And you'd asked about where we should go in terms of uh, process for these individuals. And the fact of the matter is that Congress of the United States has gone through three iterations to try to make the Military Commissions Act better and better and better. And in each iteration, it has come closer and closer to being, uh, I think, the full protections required. Uh, to give, I think, fair and legitimate trials. I think the greatest. But of course, people conducting the trials can be uh, sergeants on the battlefield or, or anybody, whatever group of people get called together. I, I, am, I am still extremely skeptical that, uh, that military commissions in the way that they are brought together could ever even come close to the safeguards in a, in a, a regular court, don't you? Well, no, there's no doubt that they are not going to be the same as the safeguards in a regular court, and part of the reason for that is uh, the evidentiary problems that I discussed previously. The, the evidentiary problems where soldiers are the ones gathering the information just are not going to meet Article Three court standards, and therefore you're not going to have the evidence necessary in an Article Three court to convict people that otherwise probably would be. And, and, and that's why I thought that I heard you suggesting that you were in somewhat favor of Article Three courts yourself. I'm in favor of Article Three courts where the defendants are apprehended by law enforcement, even overseas. I, I don't have any problem with the idea of Galilani being tried uh, in Article Three courts. However, I think that there you, you have a very different case with trying to try Khalid Sheikh Mohammed or Abu Zubaydah or others like that in Article Three courts uh, because the evidentiary basis is fundamentally flawed based upon who it is that brought that in. Uh, the other question that you'd asked earlier that I think will also segue to Mr. Scahill at some level is th the question of our relation with, with foreign nations and, yes. and how we can best uh, work with that in terms of the way we're prosecuting the war on terror. There are a lot of anecdotal discussions, such as the one that, that Mr. Scahill presented today, where Al-Qaeda members or Al-Qaeda support is being enhanced by uh, some of the actions that our special forces people take and some of the tragic uh, mistakes that they have made on occasion. And there's no question anecdotally that that is true, but I think it's important to look at much broader studies, and there are some meta-studies that have been done, particularly in the border regions of Pakistan. Uh, that indicate that overall the effect of the U.S. military's actions there is a net positive rather than a net negative. And I would uh, very strongly commend the study done by uh, Professor Echeverry Gent down at the University of Virginia uh, because he did a very detailed analysis of public opinion in Afghanistan based upon open source information over there. And while, yes, a, an individual might be turned against us because of a poorly planned or poorly executed attack, Broadly, Al-Qaeda is not popular in that region, 
And the two choices to oust al-Qaeda are either the United States or the Pakistani military. And the fact of the matter is the Pakistani military tends to use artillery, tends to use artillery very indiscriminately, and okay. has caused tremendous amounts of civilian havoc when they have attempted to, rather ineffectively in the opinion of people in Pakistan, attempted to fight al-Qaeda. And they see the United States drone strikes and the United States Special Forces operations as being far more effective in countering al-Qaeda. Mm -hmm. uh, they're not saying they're perfect, but it's sort of mm -hmm. the, uh, the, better, the better of the choices according to the people on the ground in Pakistan. And I, as I said, I would, I would commend that study to you um, for review. Thank you, and we will examine that study. I'll recognize now uh, Jeremy Scahill. Well, just, just to respond to, uh, to what Professor Lewis uh, just said, I, I, I think one thing that we've learned over the past 10 years is that these polls that are done in Pakistan and Afghanistan are just wildly inaccurate. Um, it was abundantly clear to me, not just anecdotally, but also from talking to uh, U.S. forces as well, uh, that the strength of the Taliban is growing uh, within Afghanistan and also within Pakistan. And let's remember, we're not fighting al-Qaeda in Afghanistan. According to uh, the outgoing National Security Advisor, General Jim Jones, uh, there are less than 100 al-Qaeda operatives in Afghanistan with no effective ability to strike at the United States. Um, I also talked to senior Taliban officials uh, from the Mullah Omar government who expressed a concern that when the United States is killing the leadership of the Taliban, that they're killing the only people that would be capable of negotiating a nonviolent solution to the conflict there. And in some cases, the individual commanders who are killed are replaced by commanders who are far more radical. And in fact, some of Mullah Omar's envoys, Mullah Omar being the head of the Taliban in Afghanistan, some of his envoys have actually been butchered by new Taliban commanders because they feel that Mullah Omar isn't radical enough. So I, I think we have to be very careful when we take any poll and hold it up and, and, and suggest that it's uh, evidence that we're sort of winning hearts and minds because I think it's clear to many within our armed forces uh, that that's just not the case. Um, to respond to something that, um, that Mr. Joffer said, uh, I, I think that uh, you know, I would echo Professor Fine's comment as well that if we do not hold past uh, uh, committers of torture accountable, uh, we have no mechanism by which to dissuade future acts of torture. The most effective way to stop torture is to hold torturers accountable. Um, I think it's outrageous that we didn't have uh, congressional intervention uh, of any strength in the case of the destruction of the CIA torture tapes. I think that there should have been subpoenas issued to Jose Rodriguez um, and other CIA officials to ask them about their role, to ask them if there were only three tapes or if more had been destroyed. I think Congress should have used its subpoena power uh, to go after those who were committing torture and also the officials who ordered it and authorized it. I think that's one of the great shames of the, uh, the era of the democratic control of both houses of Congress is that there was not enough done to ensure that if the president was going to hold the torturers accountable, uh, that the Congress would. I would also recommend that people read Matthew Alexander's book, um, How to Break a Terrorist. He was an interrogator in Iraq uh, and he was instrumental to gathering intelligence using non-torture techniques uh, that led to the capture of Abu Musab al-Zarqawi. Uh, and I would recommend that the committee review his work as well. In, in closing, I want to say that I think that um, the Congress needs to not just limit its investigation of these torture techniques uh, to the CIA. Torture was also committed at Camp Nama in Iraq, which was run by the Joint Special Operations Command. And I think that the failure to use the subpoena power uh, is failing the American people. We have to have accountability or it's going to continue under Democratic and Republican administrations. Well, uh, yes, Mr. Attorney Jaffer. Chairman, <coughs> appreciate the opportunity. Um, let me be clear. Torture is wrong under any and all circumstances, and there is no question that people who engage in torture should and must be prosecuted to the fullest extent of the law. Let there be no lack of clarity on that question. I think that, I think that everybody agree on that question. Uh, with, with, the, with respect to the CIA program, you have to remember that, first of all, there were a very narrow number of detainees that were held in this program. <coughs> this was not a program sort of run, uh, sort of, you know, behind closed doors with, with no uh, monitoring at all. This was a program where the CIA said, look, we've got these folks who we're capturing. We need to figure out what to do with them. They're high value. We believe they have immediate intelligence value. What should we do? They came up with a, a series of plans. They went to the policy structure of the White House 
and the Department of Justice, and they, and they said, what should we do as a policy matter or as a legal matter? And the Department of Justice came back with a set of legal opinions. Now, those legal opinions, I think, I think the, the fact of the matter is there, there, are, there were deep flaws in many legal opinions associated with that time period. Now, there was the time constraints were huge, people were working very quickly. Uh, whatever excuses you might make, there's no question, though, that there were, there were challenges with legal opinions and they were properly withdrawn by the Justice Department later on down the road and, continued, and other ones were continued to be withdrawn. And that better, more, uh, more uh, careful legal analysis was done down the road. Uh, that being said, the CIA came to the administration and said, they came to the White House and said, what should we do as a policy matter? And what can we do within the law? And then they were given legal guidance and they were given policy guidance. They were told, here's the losses you can do. And they were told, as a matter of policy, the policy of the United States is to, is to engage in these certain techniques, in certain, words, certain techniques, as the president has now said in his book, were taken off the table. Certain techniques were left on the table. And then the CIA went forward and executed what the Justice Department told them was lawful and what the policy, policy part of the government said was what we wanted to do. Now, how can we prosecute lying CIA officers? How can we justify prosecuting lying CIA officers who did what they told the law permitted them to do and that the, that the government's policy was to do. I mean, that seems to me to be just as much of a crisis as, as, as all the problems with, with, with military commissions and, and other levels of process or holding people without trial. How can you possibly take a government employee, any government employee sitting in this room, and say to them, here's what the law lets you do, and here's what I, as your boss, the commander in chief, and, the, and, the, and, and the, the head of the executive branch want you to do, and then say, oh, but you know, down the road we're gonna prosecute you for doing just what we told you to do. That seems to me to be just as much of a crime. We have been joined by uh, Professor Mary Ellen O'Connell, Professor of Law at University of Notre Dame. Uh, she's uh, the uh, designated Professor of Law at Moritz College of Law at Ohio State University. Uh, we know why she was detained, and we'd like, uh, even at this late date, uh, to invite her uh, to discuss uh, her statement uh, with us and any conversations among the panel uh, that you may have heard uh, coming in the room. Welcome, Professor O'Connell. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, in fact, my statement does touch on the comments that were just being made. So if, with your permission, I have a very succinct five-minute statement and I do begin with apologies from Delta. They uh, are very sorry about my delay. Um, Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, let me also express my deep appreciation for the invitation to speak before you today. In my very brief time, I will focus on the issue of perhaps greatest concern to many of us today, and that is targeted killing of persons away from any battlefield. Through the use of drones and other means, the United States is carrying out killings that fundamentally violate the human right to life. The justifications we have been given for these killings is fundamentally the same justification we were given for the use of torture. It consists of an erroneous definition of combatant accompanied by a plea of necessity along the lines you just heard. But as with the arguments in favor of torture, the arguments for targeted killing do not meet the tests of legality, morality, or effectiveness. Let me address each of these tests very, very briefly. First, international law absolutely prohibits the intentional targeting of persons for killing outside of the hostility situation of armed conflict. International law does not relax this prohibition except in the clear situation of actual armed conflict hostility. In such hostilities, the regular armed forces of a sovereign state may intentionally kill members of the opposing armed forces and any civilians who are directly participating in armed conflict. International law defines armed conflict as situations of organized armed groups engaged in intense armed fighting. Today, the United States is engaged in such fighting in only one place, and that is Afghanistan. Ask any soldier 
where U.S. combat operations are occurring today, and they will tell you, Afghanistan. It is only there that the United States may lawfully carry out targeted killing. Second, not only is this the law, it is the right ethical position. All human beings are endowed with dignity, which we protect through human rights, including the human right to life. Through the centuries, humanity has constantly striven to enhance respect for life. We have prohibited war through the UN Charter, and we have condemned terrorism because of its violence against human life. America's targeted killing program is a serious retrograde step in the moral advancement of humanity. It demonstrates grave disregard for the right to life. But ladies and gentlemen, if law and morality are not enough, we can also add that empirical data clearly shows that military force is ineffective to end terrorist groups. In 2008, the RAND Corporation released a study that concluded, quote, all terrorist groups will eventually end, but how do they end? Answers to this question have enormous implication for counterterrorism efforts. The evidence since 1968 indicates that most groups have ended because one, they joined the political process, or two, local police and intelligence agencies arrested or killed key members. Military force has rarely been the primary reason for the end of terrorist groups. This has significant implications for dealing with Al-Qaeda and suggests fundamentally rethinking post-September 11 U.S. counterterrorism strategy, close quote. We are told with respect to targeted killing, as we were with regard to torture, that post 9-11 circumstances require extraordinary measures. However, some of our leading ethicists responded forcefully to the arguments in favor of torture by saying that the absolute ban on torture in existence at the time that these legal memos were prepared by the White House and DOJ, a moral imperative required that absolute ban regardless of the consequences. And we could say the same for targeted killing. But as in the case of torture, it turns out that doing the moral thing, doing the legal thing, is doing the effective thing against torture. Torture is an unreliable, sorry, against terrorism. Torture is an unreliable means of interrogation that trained interrogators, including my husband, have rejected out of hand. Similarly, some of the best counterterrorism experts reject the use of military force in efforts against terrorism. Terrorists seek to undermine lawful institutions to sow chaos and discord and to foment hatred and violence. Upholding our lawful institutions, holding to our legal and moral principles in the face of such challenges is not only the right thing to do, it is a form of success against terrorism that can lead to the end of terrorist groups. Apparently, President Obama himself is aware that targeted killing by drones will not achieve greater national security in the face of terrorist threats. Bob Woodward writes in his new book, Obama's Wars, despite the CIA's love affair with unmanned aerial vehicles such as Predators, Obama understood with increasing clarity that the United States would not get a lasting durable effect with drone attacks. If we care about the rule of law, fundamental morality, and national security, we will call on President Obama to end targeted killing. Thank you. Professor Lewis, uh, you are the beginning of everyone having the last word. Well, I, I just actually wanted to comment on the, uh, the assertion that international law has clearly determined that the boundaries of the battlefield are based on geopolitical lines. Uh, that, that's never been how that's been understood in the past. In order to, to make international law, you have to either have a clear treaty uh, statement indicating uh, what international law says, and there is no clear treaty that indicates what the boundaries of the battlefield are or where the law of armed conflict uh, applies or does not apply. And so what you're left with is customary international law. And in order to make customary international law, mm -hmm. you must show not only an agreement of jurists and commentators about its content, 
which I don't believe exists. Uh, but even more importantly, you have to show some form of state practice that supports the recognition that uh, there is a legal obligation to, uh, to perform in that way. And I can think of no example at all of state practice in which a state has said, I will not strike an enemy because they have crossed a geopolitical line. Uh, and I can think of many examples in which the exact opposite is true. Uh, one that was brought before the, uh, the Government Oversight Committee earlier this year by Professor Glazier, who was generally an opponent of the Bush administration policy um, and these sorts of actions in general, was the fact that the United States pursued the Viet Cong and the North Vietnamese Army across the border into Laos and Cambodia, and yet that was not a violation of international law. Those forces were attempting to escape by finding a sanctuary across a line. Oh, yeah. And more importantly, where you have non-state actors doing the same thing, the FARC attempting to find sanctuary in Colombia, and uh, not in Colombia, sorry, from Colombia in Ecuador, and Colombia crossed the border and struck into FARC camps there, that was not deemed to be a violation of international law. And perhaps the best example is the Hezbollah war in Lebanon. According to Professor O'Connell's test, there was no armed conflict in Lebanon at the beginning of that war. There were sporadic rocket attacks, sporadic cross-border raids by Hezbollah, but that was it. And the Israeli response was to use the tools of armed conflict and invade Lebanon to go after Hezbollah. And the conflict between Hezbollah and Israel was understood by everyone to be governed by the laws of armed conflict, not to be an improper use of force where Israel was criticized, and it was criticized heavily, was because they had allegedly violated the laws of armed conflict. They hadn't been proportional, they hadn't used military necessity, they had used banned cluster munitions, et cetera. But the whole conversation throughout the whole international legal community was, have they complied with the laws of war? The laws of war clearly applied to that conflict. And yet, Professor O'Connell now is saying, if the Taliban can cross into Pakistan, they're safe. If they can get to Yemen, they're safe. They cannot be struck there. We have to use law enforcement, and that is the only method of attempting to capture them. And if there is either uh, an incapable government in Yemen or Somalia, or uh, an unfriendly government that is unwilling to uh, affect that capture, then they have found a sanctuary. And, and the claim that international law grants terrorists, of all people, a sanctuary in the, in the war on terror um, I don't believe is international law. Professor O'Connell, what say you? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I really do appreciate that. I, I've just heard such a mixture of unusual and uh, 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 um, confusing comments about the law of armed conflict. I'll just say very briefly a few things. First, the definition of armed conflict is well known and it has a territorial aspect. I just led a five-year study, produced a report of 42 pages for the International Law Association, the chief scholarly organization of international lawyers throughout the world. My committee included the 18 most highly qualified experts on the law of armed conflict from 15 different countries, every region of the world. Our study concluded that, in fact, armed conflict takes place within a particular zone. And an internal armed conflict of the kind that's occurring in Afghanistan right now, a counterinsurgency armed conflict, is taking place within Afghanistan. It is the U.S.'s official position to respect the border between Pakistan and Afghanistan. And the U.S. well knows, our lawyers well know, that there is no right of hot pursuit on land to follow those individuals who may be uh, crossing from Pakistan into Afghanistan to join the fight. What is America's option? It is, of course, first and foremost to work with our ally, Afghanistan. We are in Afghanistan at the request of that government. And if they wish for us to work with the Pakistani authorities about preventing cross-border provocation, that is our obligation under international law. If Afghanistan feels that it's being attacked by Pakistan, then it has the right under UN Charter Article 51 to respond in self-defense. But Afghanistan has said that it's not been the victim of an armed attack from Pakistan. Pakistan has, is well aware and it is taking okay, steps to pursue point. militant and violent action on its border. The International Court of Justice has told us that it is the obligation of Afghanistan and the, and the U.S. when dealing with provocations that are less than the kind of armed 
attack that would give rise to Afghanistan's right of self-defense against Pakistan, that Pakistan's obligation is on its side of the border. The U.S. can offer to help, but we cannot pretend that there is no sovereign boundary there and take the law into our own hands. These are very clear precedents. Professor Lewis should know all about them. I'm very sorry that he has presented to you a different story today. Attorney Jeff, uh, Professor Lewis, I'll allow you a brief comment and then I'll turn to Attorney Jaffer. The only thing I'd say is that there has to be some evidence of state practice to back up the idea, to say, I will not strike an enemy because they have crossed a geopolitical line, and I'm not aware of any state practice. Colombia didn't do it with the FARC, Israel didn't do it with Hezbollah, and we didn't do it with the Viet Cong and the North Vietnamese Army. Turkey doesn't do it with the PKK. I, I don't believe there's any state practice that says we agree that geopolitical lines are the end when the enemy has, is seeking sanctuary. In, in addition to our report, I would like to also refer uh, Professor Lewis to the Congo versus Uganda case of 2005 in the International Court of Justice. There is plenty of authority in that decision by the International Court of Justice, um, and that's where he needs to look for the answers to his questions. Would you submit that uh, additionally to the committee? I'd be, I'd be very happy to. I've brought um, a, a copy of my latest article that also has all the correct citations and responds to many of the other specific points that Professor Lewis made. Attorney Jaffer. Thank you for the uh, opportunity to, uh, to appear before you today. Um, you know, I, th I think the, uh, a lot of the issues that have been raised here are very important. I'd like to associate myself with Professor Lewis's rem remarks with respect to uh, the use of evidence, the topic we discussed earlier, um, obtained from uh, coercive methods, uh, whether they're called enhanced interrogation techniques or torture or whatever you want to call them, that type of evidence is inadmissible in court, in criminal court. It should not be admitted, um, and, and, and that is absolutely, uh, a, without a doubt, one of, the, one of the core principles of the American justice system. In fact, the Department of Justice in the Gailani trial uh, stipulated for the purposes of that case that the information obtained uh, with respect to the witness against Mr. Gailani um, had been obtained through coercive methods, and therefore they were, they expect they, it was not expected to be introduced. And, but and of course, we don't have that safeguard in military commissions, do we? Well, as, as I understand, as I understand it, uh, Mr. Chairman, I, I think that the current uh, military commissions uh, act, the 2009 one passed by uh, passed by Congress, uh, uh, does not permit the use of coercive uh, of information obtained from coercive techniques uh, in the military commissions either. No, no, it don't. It doesn't. But. The practice, I mean, you're on a battlefield. Uh, how, many, how many people that are drafted into a military commission have, uh, knows about the, the law that we just passed, uh, cautioning them to be uh, uh, careful uh, about uh, uh, torture or, or enhanced interrogation techniques? That's, a, that's an important. That's an important question, Mr. Chairman. Um, you know, as you know, um, just like in the federal courts, in the military commissions, there are judges uh, who make the legal determinations, and so one would presume that in, in the military commission <coughs> context, a yeah, legal but they're judges, but they're not, they're they're appointed judges. They're not really judges. They're not even lawyers. I I, I believe, and I could be, I could be mistaken, but I believe that the judges for the military commissions are are are, are jag are are military lawyers. I could be mistaken. I, I, well, let's clear it up. Well, that's a great response. Are they or aren't they? Well, yes. They are JAG lawyers. The, All right. the judge must not only be a JAG lawyer, the, the judge must also be, uh, have gone through judicial training in addition to being a JAG lawyer. I so see. The judge, now your okay. members could be other people. Your, your right. Honor, if I could uh, just interject there. In the Federalist Papers, the Founding Fathers described the very definition of tyranny, combining within the same branch law enforcement and law adjudication and law making. And that's what a military commission is. In the executive branch, they play judge, jury, prosecutor, and define what a war crime is. Now, putting aside whether they have legal training, they know that they report 
the commander in chief. And the whole reason why we have an independent judiciary with life tenure is because, and there's the crown jewel of the Constitution, because that's how you get an unfettered, impartial mind. It's not worried about whether his superior is going to want one thing or another. But it was the founding fathers who described military commissions as the very definition of tyranny. Does anybody on the panel uh, take any exception or want to qualify what uh, Professor Fine, or Attorney Fine has said? Laura Murphy. Things that we need to be clear about is that um, even though you may, uh, we believe that you have to be a JAG lawyer to be a judge, you don't have to have ever tried um, an international terrorism or other complex criminal case. And so, you know, I don't think that as, as much talent as there is in military commissions, it doesn't compare to the talent that a federal district court judge has or that the U.S. attorneys have in prosecuting complex criminal conspiracy cases, which is es essentially what terrorism trials are. And so, you know, there were some improvements made in the Military Commissions Act of 2009, but we don't think that the, um, the, the training for the lawyers or the judges is adequate to, to deliver justice. Attorney Jaffer seems to nod his approval. Well, I, I, think, I think that I agree uh, to the extent that I believe that federal district court judges have a tremendous amount of experience um, in trying complex criminal cases, including in some instances international uh, terrorism cases. Uh, our federal prosecutors at the Department of Justice are phenomenal uh, folks. These are career prosecutors in AUSA offices across, uh, offices across the country at Maine Justice. I mean, these are the people who would be ideal to prosecute uh, these terrorists I, I, and, and, to, and to be tried before these judges. It, my view is simply that, uh, and, and, I, and I share actually Attorney Fine's uh, uh, concerns about the appearance of, 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 of the folks who capture the, the, the individuals, um, also trying them um, and, and, and acting as judges. Now, let me also be clear that these military judges, these, these military lawyers are among the best lawyers that America has to offer. Uh, they have stood up and served our country. They, um, they get immediate trial experience. JAG lawyers, their first day on the job going to trials, I understand it. Um, and so these are not lawyers with, with little experience who are, who, are, who are not capable. These are, these are, these are terrific, uh, terrific Americans who have chosen to serve their country. They have, uh, they have decided to go, be, go to law school, become lawyers, admitted to the bar. They've, they've engaged in numerous trials. So the fact they haven't necessarily tried complex criminal cases, I agree. Federal courts are better. There's no doubt. And in an ideal world, in fact, I think the federal courts are the best option. They're the ones that make us appear to do, the ju appear to do justice, and, and there are systems. That being said, Professor Lewis seems to agree with you uh, on that point. They simply don't work in the context of national security detainees, and there's an option out there that you, where you could appear to do justice and use federal sitting judges and AUSAs and clear, clear defense counsel who experience these cases. That's important, too, for the protection of the, of the individual being tried. I, I do agree that... Article III courts are a better option. I, as I mentioned in my opening, though, I think that there are a certain subset of cases in which the evidentiary hurdles that it presents and the people who are gathering the information from overseas are just not a good fit. Uh, Je uh, Jeremy Scahill? You know, it, it's, it's pretty clear that uh, when it comes to the issue of torture um, and accountability for it, that the United States government holds itself to one standard and the rest of the world to a, to a different standard. Um, you know, I, I also wanted to add that when it became clear that the Obama administration had authorized the assassination of a United States citizen, Anwar al laki by either the Central Intelligence Agency or the Joint Special Operations Command, Representative Dennis Kucinich put forward a very simple piece of legislation that said that the United States shouldn't uh, assassinate its own citizens without due process. I think five members of Congress co-signed or co-sponsored that legislation. That's a shocking commentary on the state of affairs in the Capitol today, that only six American uh, politicians, legislators, would sign on to such a simple piece of legislation that said we shouldn't assassinate our own citizens without due process. What I think we're, we're seeing unfold around the world today is a situation where in Afghanistan we're propping up drug dealers, war criminals, and mass murderers yeah. in the name of democracy. Okay. We are bombing countries that we're not at war with, Yemen, Somalia, Pakistan. 
we are creating a new generation of insurgents that want and have every justification or reason to rise up against the United States because they actually have grievances now uh, because members of their families have been killed. I, I, I feel very sad when I think about the future of our democracy um, because I think that what we're doing right now is sending a message to the rest of the world uh, that in many ways our foreign policy represents that of the very rogue states that we denounce on a regular basis. And I, I don't say that lightly. I say it uh, with a great sense of sobriety uh, because I think it's shocking. And when you go to these war zones and you meet with the victims that live on the other end of the barrel of the gun that is our foreign policy, and they, they ask journalists, well, what can you do for us? The only thing we can do is come back to this body and ask that you do something about it or try to give them access to lawyers. One of the ironies of the, of the dark <laughs> years of the Bush administration was that trial lawyers emerged as some of the strongest freedom fighters we had in this society. But for the, the Center for Constitutional Rights and the ACLU, um, I think we would be in a much darker situation right now. So I'm very disturbed by, by, by a lot of what I've, I've heard today and a lot of what's going on in the world. Um, and I think a lot of it, when it comes down to Congress, boils down, as I said earlier, to the failure to use subpoena power. I think that's one of the, 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 uh, the actions that Congress can take uh, that is a way of actually uh, affecting some kind of, uh, of, of responsibility or accountability when the other branches of government fail. And yet, we've seen almost none of it uh, with the Democrats in power in this Congress. And I, I, I hope that if the Democrats do regain the Congress, control of the House, that the subpoena power is used on these life and death issues. But can uh, these hearings begin the, be, uh, the, uh, begin the uh, commencement of a, of a potentially more optimistic view on your part in the coming uh, Congress? <laughs> well, uh, I, I think the empty chair next to you is an indication of where things are headed, uh, Mr. Chairman. And, um, and I think that um, you know, we're going to see the targeting of the great enemy to our society, ACORN, um, and you know maybe Van Jones will be subpoenaed. You know these uh, these great threats to U.S. national security. Um, but I, I I think we have to hold our own people accountable. And I just I, I wish this committee had used its subpoena power more, uh, quite frankly, um, and the oversight committee as well. Yes, it's it's a, it's a it's a sign of optimism to directly answer your question that uh, you so kindly agreed or, or initiated this hearing. Um, but I think that the work has just begun, and, and hopefully, uh, if you're chair again, uh, we'll see some subpoenas uh, flying out of this office. Professor O'Connell. Um, I'm, mo I'm more optimistic than uh, Mr. Scahill. I recall the great tradition of the Republican Party in terms of fidelity to international law. It was Abraham Lincoln, a Republican, who asked to have the first set of code of armed conflict for the law of land warfare to be written. And those rules are the fundamental rules that should be guiding how the United States conduct it, conducts itself today. One of our greatest secretaries of state, Elihu Root, founded the American Society of International Law with its object of promoting understanding and uh, international relations under the rule of international law. I think if Republicans respect their tradition, the tradition of this country where our founding fathers were well-versed in international law, understood what it took to be a good citizen in the world, respecting international borders, respecting the authorities of international courts and tribunals, respecting what the well-versed, well-trained, proficient authorities, professors, publicists in international law had to say. I think if we see that, and I will do my level best from my position at Notre Dame to remind our uh, Republican colleagues, our Republican elected representatives, that that is their tradition. That is the tradition of this country. And we can continue to add the counterexample, which Mr. Scahill and I absolutely share. We've tried these expansive, lawless approaches, these uh, uh, extraordinary arguments that were not based in authority or good faith analysis of the law. And where are we today? We have so little to show. We have not regained our standing in the world. There's only one way to do that, and that's to return to fidelity of the rule of law for which this country was founded. I think if, uh, if we proceed in goodwill, and those of us in a position to speak out and write out and, and continue to teach students, um, I, I have hope that this country will not 
further stray from our path and from who we are as Americans. I that appreciate means, that. I could just add one brief comment. I'm married to a combat veteran who was a United States Army interrogator, and I think that his sacrifice and that of all of our serving men and women is to be respected, and he fought for the rule of law. He fought in the Gulf War, which he knew was on behalf of enforcing the United Nations Charter. He fought under orders in respect for the Constitution, but that's what we all owe all of our serving men and women, respect for law, and we should not uh, continue on this path that disregards that. Thank you so very much. Uh, Mr. Scahill, uh, are you aware uh, if uh, the chairman of this committee was on H.R. 6010 prohibiting the extraterritorial killing of U.S. citizens? Yes. Yes, you were aware? Yes. Uh, so do you know that I am a co-sponsor? Yes. All right. I, oh, yeah. No, and I, and I commend you for that. No, I mean, I, yes, of course. But had you mentioned that before now? Oh well, it's it's uh, it's it's your committee, Mr. Oh, Chairman. I should and know. I, I, I should know that yeah. I'm on the bill. I, and I, I I think you were one of the uh, half a dozen brave members of Congress that had the audacity to stand up against our government assassinating our own citizens without due process. Well, I don't think it takes that much audacity. No, I, I'm I'm I don't think it does. I, I what I think is audacious is that only six of you, I believe I'm correct, uh, actually co-sponsored that legislation. I congratulate you for it. Uh, Perf Mr. Attorney Mr. Fine. To, to add to that, I would compliment you as also being a supporter of a bill that I drafted with Walter Jones to have the audacious prohibition on a president intentionally and knowing lying to Congress to obtain authorization for war, sort of a revolutionary principle. And that, again, had a handful of, of co-sponsors. But just a couple of final closing points. One, due process is not simply a slogan. Uh, on Guantanamo Bay, after the Supreme Court declared that habeas corpus was available to the detainees, the vast majority that had hearings have been concluded not to be enemy combatants. And this is even though the administration is able to rely on secret evidence to prove enemy combatant status. And these are people that, as the words of former Secretary of Defense uh, Rumsfeld said, were the worst of the worst. Uh, so due process matters. Uh, yeah. They don't get it right all of the time. With regard to the idea of um, battlefield, what is and is not, what to me is rather alarming is that when you declare or find yourself at war with a tactic as opposed to a country, there are no boundaries. That if you say you're at war with international terrorism, the boundary is all of the planet. It can go interplanetary, intergalactic, wherever the tactic could conceivably be used. And that's what makes so dangerous the idea that we have the legal architecture of war in fighting international terrorism, because it means you can use military force anywhere you think someone is a terrorist, including in this very committee room. Uh, lastly, at least with regard to um, waterboarding, if it really works so well, I'm puzzled as to why those on this panel and, and maybe others who supported it uh, aren't championing that it be reinstituted. I don't know anyone saying we need Congress to pass a law saying the administration shall use waterboarding because it's so effective at gathering um, uh, useful information of thwarting terrorist attacks. I think the fact that it was abandoned once it came under the sunshine uh, exemplifies that it was hardly uh, the necessary uh, uh, tool to prevent future terrorist attacks. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you. Uh, I, I'd like to say on behalf of the committee but there is nobody here on this committee that sanctions waterboarding on, on, uh, on among the witnesses uh, that uh, in this discussion. I think that's accurate. Uh, J Ambassador Pickering, you started us off, and I would ask you to make any closing comments that you would like to make before we adjourn. Two or three points, Mr. Chairman, before I begin, there's a tendency in this town and sometimes up here on the Hill uh, that while everything has been said, not everybody has said it yet. I'll try to resile from that. I want to thank you for having the hearings. I think they brought out a number of very interesting points. It's been interesting that while the debate has had something of a partisan flavor from time to time, there are enough home truths that I think one can draw from this 
and your very vital and interesting cross examination of us all that there is a way ahead my own sense is that there is an entire compatibility between national security and honoring and observing human and civil rights this is where i began my sense is that that still remains the deep underlying theme of this particular hearing and even though we have had differences in degree about how the various pieces of this could come together i think we have no difference across the group here in any way in principle thank you mr chairman thank you all very much uh, this hearing stands adjourned